in it to log in. We've got about 60 people registered for today's session. Uh, it's the second session. Maria will get started in a moment to walk you through. There's a lot of content to move through in a short period of time. Uh, so we're just going to give everyone that time to log in. If you don't mind, if you're logging in because it's a Zoom meeting platform, your microphone might be a, a, on and open. We really do welcome you keeping your video on and it keeps things personal. Um, but if you can mute, that would be great. Okay, so I can see the participants logging in. We've got, we've just uh, clicked over the 50% mark. So since we have some administrative items to get out the way, Maria, I'm going to recommend we call the meeting to order and start on those administrative items while we wait for everybody to log in. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Josipa. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so uh, we are going to start the hydrogen rail feasibility modeling and pilot deployment. Thank you for joining this session. This is the se session number two. Um, so next slide, please. So, okay, these, these are uh, some uh, housekeeping uh, Zoom. I think everybody is, uh, is comfortable with, with that. So we can skip that, uh, yes, please. Move to the next slide, please. All right, and we're just going to start off everyone with a little bit of an introduction to the Smart Rail Innovation Program at QTRIC. Um, we're going to walk you through, as Maria will note, several sessions that we've already had and are coming up, and it's culminating at our conference coming up. So with that, we're just going to, as we wait for everybody to log in, play a little video that helps you understand what our intention is around Smart Rail, in particular around hydrogen. Over to you, Jess. Thanks very much, Jess. So uh, the intention of that video obviously is to wake everybody up, but also to let folks know these are some of the exciting things we think need to be happening in Canada. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Maria to let you all know who has registered for today's session. Uh, but it is important to note that we're trying to force this dialogue forward in a really innovative and targeted manner in Canada because there just isn't enough rail and the rail isn't good enough for passengers. That's just the point of truth. And so for us to address climate in action, achieve all these goals and innovation. We just need more rail, needs to be better, and it needs to be innovative in the country. So trying to figure out what Qtrix role is here, what our role is not, and what our industry partners are already doing, and what government needs them to be doing, and where we can help facilitate that with our partners. So with that, Maria, over to you if you just want to walk us through the participants. Uh, thank you, Josipa. Yes, so um, we are, um, we have uh, a lot of participants in, uh, in several uh, categories. So we have transit agencies, transit operators, government uh, representatives, the industry infra in manufacturers, academia, nonprofit organizations, associations, consulting services. So you can see here the list of participants. Uh, also, we have uh, the private sector um, individuals. Here, so um, we can highlight via rail, Metrolink, so BB Austria, Southern Railway, and B British Columbia. Uh, the government of, of Canada is uh, re the representation that we have right now is uh, Transport Canada, Natural Resources Canada, the government of Northwest Territories. Uh, in the industry and manufacturers, we have Hitachi uh, Energy, Ballard, Alstom, Shift to Rail, Ricardo Rail, 
and the academia nonprofit organizations and different associations, uh, Ontario Tech University, Ontario of Bit, uh, University, sorry, of British Columbia, British Columbia Institute of Technology, Ryerson University, Polytechnic Montreal, uh, Canada Urban Transit Association, the Canadian Hydrogen Fuel Cell Association, the Industrial Association for Public Transport, uh, um, Austrian Institute of Technology, Transport Action Canada, CSI Group, OSP, King's College in, from London, and Consulting Services, Data Consult Consultancy Services, Jensen Hughes, IBI Group, Parson, Dear Energy, Gannett Flenning, GHD, Water Resources, ABGI Canada, TSI Service Management, uh, Jacobs, Hatch, Plant Group, uh, SNC Lavalin, Trellis Transit, and DB in Engineering and Consulting. So there is a long group uh, here, and uh, and we we are going to have a very interesting discussion. Next slide, please. So I'm going to ask. Sorry, Maria, I talked over yeah. you there. Thanks very much. Uh, so we're going to turn to a, a call to order here at 106, exactly on time. And we just, for the sake of Qtric governance, need a member designate to motion to call to order or approve the agenda rather. So we'll call to order at 106 and I'll just ask for a motion to approve the agenda that was pre-disseminated. And Jürgen, I see you on the line all the way from Austria from AIT and you are a member designate. So if you're comfortable, if you can add in the chat or unmute yourself and let us know you motion to approve the agenda. And I'm going to ask also Kim, your member designate as well, so you're also able to do that for us. Oh, here I am, yeah. Thank Sorry you, <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Jürgen, I appreciate all the way from Austria, so it's not early for you either. And Kim, thank you very much. So with that, we have a motion to approve the agenda. Thanks to you both. Uh, next, we'll turn to uh, Maria for the welcome and intro to the hydrogen mm -hmm. session specifically here today. Over to Thank you, you Josipa. Uh, yes, so um, uh, welcome, the formal welcome uh, to the Smart Rail Innovation Program 2022-2025. Uh, this is the session number two. Uh, so the, the theme that we are going to discuss is the hydrogen rail feasibility modeling and pilot deployment. Next slide, please. So we are gonna start with the concept. So what is a hydrogen rail system? So we can identify a hydrogen rail system if it converts hydrogen to electric energy. Uh, hydrogen is the fuel that is replacing diesel. Hydrogen system can operate by internal combustion or reactions. So uh, okay, it was. So I'm just going to remind folks, if you don't mind muting yourselves, uh, just because we're using a simplified Zoom platform, so we can't force a mute. Uh, over to you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Josipa. And, and uh, um, the last characteristic is that uh, they create uh, uh, automotive power. So water uh, vapor is, is by product. So it's a clean, um, clean power. And uh, these are the main characteristics uh, of the hydrogen rail system. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, there are different variations uh, in the hydrogen rail system. Uh, so we can have the system uh, with the uh, conversion through the fuel cells, hydrogens, uh, or battery pack. So as you can see here, this is the hybrid system. Uh, also the, the location of these uh, elements can change. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna um, uh, uh, introduce my colleague, uh, Roberto Sadenberg, that is going to present uh, this, uh, this next section. Roberto, over to you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, nice to uh, meet you uh, here. Uh, as Maria pointed out, um, I'm gonna uh, guide you through a little bit of more like the technical details here of uh, hydrogen 
real. Uh, but uh, I'm a, a senior lead at the Zebra Consulting Services here. And uh, after this brief technical uh, explanation to uh, perhaps uh, help folks that are not familiar with the technology, I'll be presenting uh, some later slides on uh, the uh, modeling work that we have done and that we are including uh, real uh, works as well. So uh, as um, uh, Maria was was uh, pointing out, uh, you can use hydrogen in an internal combustion engine, or you can oxidize it to produce electrical energy and then run through a battery and then propel the 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 train or your vehicle uh, with uh, an electric motor. Um, and there are essentially uh, a few ways in which you can produce hydrogen and uh, the cost and the impact, the environmental impact will uh, be different as well. So if you uh, focus on the uh, left column that I have there, uh, what is called green hydrogen, it's essentially uh, a method of, of, of producing that fuel, which we call electrolysis. Uh, we essentially uh, uh, run water, uh, uh, to a place where we can we can uh, uh, put two electrodes in there and and uh, release electrical energy. That electrical energy will break up water molecules. And there are two uh, products to this chemical reaction. One is the hydrogen fuel itself, and the other is it's uh, oxygen. So it's a very clean process uh, because again, there's no, uh, harmful gases as a product here. So you can literally produce hydrogen with just like water and electricity and have oxygen as a byproduct, very clean process. Uh, but it is, uh, expensive and I'll, uh, provide some comparisons later down in this presentation as well, so that you can have a sense of of how how expensive or, or or like an idea of the efficiency of this process as well. On the other hand, uh, if you focus on the uh, second blob that we have there, that encompasses what we call gray and blue hydrogen. Um, those uh, uh, methods of production essentially uh, um, utilizes uh, methane or natural gas, and there's a chemical reaction with water steam. Um, so when uh, those two uh, chemicals are uh, uh, processed together in a, a high pressure and temperature environment, uh, you will produce hydrogen. But the, the, the ugly side of these uh, methods of production here is that you'll generate a significant amount of carbon dioxide. And that is what we are trying to avoid in the first place. So if you just release that carbon to the atmosphere, uh, you have your gray hydrogen and it's, it's uh, not a clean uh, method of production at all, uh, but there's an option in which you can uh, capture that uh, byproduct, the carbon dioxide here, and you can um, uh, it, essentially, you, you enclose that hydrogen into a, a, a vessel and you seal it and you can bury it uh, or you can uh, inject into a geological formations under the ground. And there are some concerns about uh, this hydrogen leaking as well. Um, but in principle, um, blue hydrogen can be uh, um, a, middle, a middle ground between the cleanest form, which is green hydrogen, but very expensive and the gray hydrogen, which is relatively cheap, uh, but um, not clean at all. Uh, so uh, those are um, the uh, types of hydrogen uh, that uh, mostly uh, we can uh, have. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I, I, I included here a, a few like very high level comparisons uh, for us to uh, have a sense of the efficiency of producing hydrogen here. And I'm looking at uh, uh, electrolytic hydrogen, which is the uh, most uh, clean form uh, uh, for production of this fuel. 
Uh, and electrolysis usually has an efficiency between 70 and 80%, uh, which means that you roughly need 50 kilowatt hour to produce each kilogram of hydrogen. Now, uh, we have a lot of uh, data and uh, modeling work as well around fuel cell electric buses. Um, and when you compare the, uh, the, uh, the amount of fuel that those uh, vehicles consume, uh, with uh, battery electric buses, uh, you will conclude that you need 3.5 as much energy to power uh, uh, a fuel cell electric bus. Or in other words, with the same energy that you run one fuel cell electric bus, uh, you could run three battery electric buses. And that inefficiency uh, comes from the fact that you have to convert the electricity into hydrogen and then you oxidize that hydrogen to produce electricity again to run your, your vehicles, your, your buses, or your, your uh, train there. Uh, the uh, good side of things is uh, the energy density. So if you look at the uh, bullet points on the right side there and you compare the energy density, hydrogen uh, can store more than 150 times more energy in a terms of energy per weight or kilowatt hour per kilogram of, of, uh, of fuel storage there. So 100, more than 150 times more than lithium ion batteries. And that is what makes hydrogen so appealing for uh, rail specifically. Uh, so I'll talk to you more about uh, the modeling that we do and, and, and more technical stuff. Uh, but I, I think that is a, is a good introduction uh, for the next few slides uh, that we have here. So uh, over uh, back to you, Maria. Thank you, Roberto. Next slide, please. Um, um, we are going to start with uh, the program, uh, how uh, we start the program and uh, the roadmap. So next slide, please. So uh, this program, uh, it was identified um, to start uh, with an important uh, themes for rail. And the initial uh, point uh, that indicated that to us, it was uh, the Rail Innovation in Canada uh, report. So Kutrick uh, developed a report in 2020 uh, with a list of 10 themes uh, in technology, in rail technology. And then uh, mm, we, we had a conference in 2020. Um, before that, the Zero Emission Transit Fund, it was announced by the government in, in the same, same year. Uh, we uh, hit uh, by the pandemic and the transportation sector and the climate change uh, they were uh, priorities. And then, um, so we decided to start with the program because we identified that uh, mm, mm, different themes and, and additional themes that we identified before, they were with a lot of interest in the last conference. And, uh, and uh, it was important to us to develop a program uh, to go ahead with uh, technology in rail in Canada. So this is the roadmap. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, we can see uh, here some of the phases that we had in the second uh, conference that I mentioned before. And, uh, and uh, important topics for rail uh, were uh, presented at that time. Next slide, please. So some of the core messages from uh, the presenters at that time in the conference in 2021. So we had Metrolinks, uh, the core uh, message um, that included uh, rail as a transit. Uh, it, it was that, uh, we needed to, to do more because it's easy, it's easy to use, uh, bring integration, 
uh, bring distances short, uh, also create network, uh, to create network observers. And uh, the train, uh, train frequency and capacity we needed to increase. Uh, um, other core messages from Infrastructure Canada. Uh, so um, um, we had from the SkyTrain line project uh, and also different considerations about the additional projects that the rail uh, technology or rail project per se uh bring uh, as a an opportunity uh, as an example extension of highways uh building bridges etc cetera, etc cetera. so next next slide please and Maria, I'm just going to step in and walk through some of the next highlights uh, just as we get on track, um, because we want to make sure we end this section in time for our speaker. I know, Kim, you have to catch a flight or so. Uh, so as Maria noted, we had kicked it off with that smart rail session. We covered those areas. We also had at that conference uh, the Ballard presentation. And uh, Jess, you can go ahead and, and present the deck there. So we had the Ballard presentation on the versatility of application, and we also had Canadian Pacific Rails way come out and say look we've got a hydrogen locomotive program something that they had informed of us of years previous that they were going to invest in had by that point last year launched the prototype so if we go forward to the next slide one of the areas we did hear about last year was the fact that the rem was not going to look at hydrogen as many of you know that it was going to be fully electric but hydrogen was just not on the radar now rem has all other kinds of issues going on but nonetheless we heard very clearly that hydrogen for rail was not at all a strategic goal in quebec if that has changed that is something new that we're going to be keen to find out if you go forward one more slide, we also heard in our literature review in our conference last year that the European Union had really blasted Canada out of the water. Uh, the EU countries represented today by some of our colleagues from Shift to Rail and also UITP had already moved ahead with very aggressive climate action efforts. This being, of course, prior to the war in the Ukraine, but nonetheless, having moved forward so robustly that hydrogen rail was most certainly on the radar and had already been deployed. And if we move forward one more slide, just look Looking at how it had already been deployed across Europe, looking at the deployment of those zero emissions vehicles and the fact that there was very strong EU investment in both hydrogen buses and hydrogen rail across uh, the European Union jurisdiction. Now, that last bullet point came out very clearly, and this is all the way back to 2020. We were informed at our first kickoff rail uh, set of activities that Europe was not going backward. It was greening its freight transport, and that was going to be doubling uh, it, within a doubling of rail by 2050. So lots going on there. And if we want to go forward one more slide, just to give you a bit of an overview of the literature then that we've looked at, and Maria's done a great job looking around to see like what has happened uh, in the last years to see how far behind are we, because it's not a discussion of like, should Canada be in this game? It's, it's when are we going to get in this game from a rail perspective? You can see there's some major achievements, the Karadia Island, which we've heard a lot about from our colleagues, uh, not only at Alstom, but also at OBB and uh, other transit associate or transit transit agencies, the Hydroflex deployment, the Aspen Railway deployment, another Karate Island, and I believe Karate Island has been now deployed in dozens of countries. If we go forward, you can see there in the next slide, the 2016 deployment in Germany that really set the, the agenda. And if we go forward one more slide, the deployment in 2019 with the first hydrogen powered rail um, fitted track or, or rather pack. And that was uh, designed in part by our partner, Ricardo Rail. And if we go forward one more slide, the Aspen Rail deployment there with Alstom as a leader in terms of the first predestined non-electrified mountainous route network. Uh, so so that was really quite interesting uh, to explore that. And then moving forward into the Karate Island next slide with Germany's 2022 deployment by Alstom. So lots going on in the industry. Um, if we go forward one more slide and continuing on that Karate Island uh, T-train deployment, some of the implications there being that range of a thousand kilometers running for an entire day, the train saving 1.6 meter, a million liters. I mean, this is a huge amount of fuel savings and a huge amount of emissions reductions. 
And the issue is how can we do it in Canada? So if we go to the next slide, what we looked at, well, what are some of the major rail projects in Canada? Of course, we know there's lots of LRT around this country being deployed or being announced. And then in freight rail, we know that CPR and CN have now launched some of their prototype projects in electric and hydrogen locomotives. So that's exciting because it wasn't the case five years ago when we first started investigating this area. If we go to the next slide, you can also see that Go Transit, very new uh, initiative. Many of us remember the days of Go Transit talking about going hydrogen, and then Metrolinx killed that strategy. And now, fast forward to where we are, uh, Metrolinx has an electrification plan at the Ministry of Transportation that was made clear during the Opta conference this summer. We're all waiting for additional details, but that could be an exciting area for hydrogen to return to. And if we go forward a couple, uh, one more slide, we have TransLink launching its expansion of rail, but no discussion yet about hydrogen being within that landscape, unless those are discussions behind closed doors. If we go forward to the next slide, in terms of via rail really being the opportunity for passenger rail in this country, a lot of the discussion there around modernization is around high frequency rail. No discussion right now about hydrogen in via rail, at least uh, not publicly, unless it's happening behind closed doors. And if we go forward one slide to CPR, here really exciting, the Ballard Power System that is providing hydrogen fuel to CPR's prototype. This being super exciting because CPR in 2020 delivered on what it said it was going to do in 2018 and 2017, prototype and test a hydrogen rail car. So that is quite exciting that it is happening, but it's in the freight sector. And if we go forward one more slide, CN on its end, as many of you are familiar, prototyping the battery electric locomotive and that that uh, emerging this year more recently. Those are some exciting movements because we all know CP and CN basically on the track and control the rail industry in the country. So it's exciting to see that they're moving forward. But what does that mean for passenger mobility? So with that, um, if we go forward one more slide here, we can see some work in progress, Transport Canada, the CSA, Natural Resources Canada, all of them exploring to different extents, some of the role of hydrogen in rail potentially. If we go forward one more slide, looking at some of the work that Transport Canada has done now, a hydrogen rail feasibility study more recently uh, with Metrolinx and some of the mapping and the road mapping for hydrogen applications. So that's quite exciting. If you move forward one more slide, you'll see Natural Resources Canada has started uh, laying out the foundation and road mapping its way to a thriving economy. Well, that's exciting because natural, or, sorry, this is NRC, uh, the National Research Council's uh, laboratory services, but under NRCAN nonetheless. So presumably this all falling in line with the federal hydrogen strategy. And that leads us to the final set of outcomes, which is in the last few years, we did do a whole series of SWATs. And now we're following up again on our rail focused SWAT and analysis with the industry. And the session here today is on hydrogen rail feasibility and modeling and pilot deployments, something that our industry partners told us over the last three to four years is what has to happen. And something that CP and CN have demonstrated has to happen in prototype mode. Some of the outcomes of that SWAT work, if we go forward one slide there, Jess, actually, if you go forward two slides, some of the outcome of that SWAT work, you can see are the strengths and the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats, several of them identified already by that industry that fed into this process that Qtrick led over the last years. I'm not going to go too far into depth with these. If you go forward one slide, though, uh, what the rail industry told us in the past around hydrogen rail in Canada is the big threat is political change, that nobody seems to be able to get federal political engagement on actual money for the <laughs> deployment and launch. And if you go forward to opportunities, the industry told us in the last few years, in a report we published openly, that there's just a huge amount of GHGs that could be reduced, not just from freight, but from passenger as we move people out of cars and into rail in any case. So if we go forward the next slide, you can see across Canada, um, and I just published an op-ed in the Hill Times today about this very issue. We now have, unlike five years ago, several hydrogen strategies around the country. And you can see that there are strategic partnerships, there's enabling of policies, there's regional blueprints, there's de-risking of investments, there's innovations and in codes and standards. And there's just a number of hydrogen strategies today provincially that did not exist before. 32 recommendations in total under eight different pillars across those provincial jurisdictional strategies and federal jurisdictional strategy. That is new, but there's still not a money allocated to those strategies for these demonstration deployments or build outs. 
And so if we go forward and we take a look at the strategy at a federal level, um, just looking at uh, the high, highlighting rail as a potential end use in hydrogen transport. So with that, I am going to turn to Maria. Maria, if you want to walk us through some of the strategic outlines that we've discovered in the last little while that feed into our first presenters for today's session. Oh, and I think we've just got you on mute there, Maria. So next, while we're, there you yeah. go, Maria, over to you. Next slide. next slide. Thank you, Josipa. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we have, uh, as, men as uh, Josipa mentioned, uh, strategies in different uh, provinces. So um, for uh, Ontario, so there is no uh, funding um, opportunities per se for rail um or this uh technology but uh there are some uh, strategies that uh, ontario is following uh to reduce the ghg emission until 2050 uh, as mentioned um different regions um have distinct infrastructure so they are working um based on that and, and also there are some benefits that Ontario uh, strat, uh, hydrogen strategy um, um, want to provide uh, to some adopters uh, of the hydrogen technology. So next slide, please. So British Columbia is focusing in production, utilization and development of fueling uh, economy. Next slide, please. And there is some um, steps. Um, so uh, working with the industry, uh, so going forward with uh, uh, some incentives, uh, continuing increasing uh, the development of uh, hydrogen technology. Um, so um, like increasing also uh, some initiatives uh, to um, establish uh some uh other in other uh, path uh for the goal of the use the using uh hydrogen as a power uh in uh, british columbia so next slide please so these are the the funding programs available in hydrogen for hydrogen strategy in british columbia so uh, go electric program uh, go electric hydrogen fueling and federal stacking hydrogen. So all these programs are facilitating uh, the use of hydrogen or uh, to start projects in that uh, field. Next slide, please. So for Quebec, uh, so uh, hydrogen energy is, um, uh, in Quebec, uh, the focus is green hydrogen, uh, the transition, uh, the priority is uh, the use in industrial processes and use the green uh, hydrogen. And funds, available funds right now, uh, natural resources and energy capital fund is in uh, Quebec. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass uh, um, this section uh, to uh, Roberto uh, to introduce uh, the modeling work and the importance of the modeling work in rail. Uh, thank you again, Maria. Uh, if we can get the next slide, please. OK, uh, then I, I would uh, like to uh, uh, talk to you about our uh, Rotai modeling tool uh, briefly here. It won't take much of your time. Uh, so uh, we are um, uh, under the ZEP consulting services, so zero emission uh, bus consulting services here. Uh, that's the team that we work in Kiltrick, but that is already a legacy name because uh, our crown uh, jewel here, uh, Rotai tool, um, is actually uh, 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 technology neutral. Uh, so uh, we consider multiple platforms. We work with uh, trucks, buses, uh, smaller vehicles like uh, shuttles, 
uh, and we are including rail as well. So uh, that is uh, uh, one of the main things that we wanted to uh, flag here. Uh, and one of the natural uh, places for us to deploy this uh, uh, accurate and uh, comprehensive modeling tool would be, for example, GoRail or VRail or, or Fright as well. That, that would be a very interesting. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, our uh, tool is uh, very comprehensive in the sense that, for example, uh, we captured the topography of the terrain and the weight distribution with the loads and uh, all of the uh, traffic impediments that might might be uh, around the the the, uh, the train. So uh, we are uh, able to calculate, for example, the uh, the dynamic state of charge of the battery of the vehicles or the level of fuel tank, and that allows us to uh, do some, uh, to uh, output some interesting results in terms of economical analysis, environmental analysis, implementation planning, how, how like to deploy those assets, what is the infrastructure related to deploying those assets, your operational efficiencies, such as the amount of energy per distance travel and per weight carried as well. Um, uh, we essentially, uh, um, uh, uh, provide solutions, optimize solutions uh, for your system uh, because there might be multiple solutions. So hydrogen, battery electric, and uh, we, we have looked at, at some cases at uh, renewable natural gas as well. So what we uh, generally optimize uh, the, the system and uh, we essentially uh, look at the minimal number of assets that you need to deploy to cover your demand. So that, that will be a very interesting um, deployment when uh, we uh, do some modeling for um, hydrogen rail as well. Um, of course, there are plenty of other uh, things that we, we assess here, the uh, safety priorities, risk assessment, and other things like resourcing, uh, training for, for people uh, uh, to operate those vehicles. And uh, the list is long. Uh, but uh, I, I won't uh, take much of your time. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, this will be just my contact information in case you want to uh, uh, know a little bit more about our tool and what it can uh, do. What information uh, do you need to to input for us to to do the modeling? So uh, you can just contact me there. So thank you, and back to you, Maria. And just Maria, while you're getting online there, as a heads up to folks, um, RootEye Rail is something that we are launching within that RootEye 3.0. And that's because in the last round of consultation we did a couple of years ago with Rail, uh, not an area that Qtrick was playing in at that time because we're nonprofit, we're pretty small, we we're focusing on buses. Um, our industry members asked us to set it up and that's why it's been created. So we don't build tools or, or consulting work or anything like that unless our members ask us for it. It was requested uh, and that came from CP, CN, Via, Ballard, several others, TransLink, uh, who were part of that consultation process at that time. And so that is something that we'll need to uh, engage this industry with because there's also a lot of other for-profit consultants out there that can do this kind of work. So the question is, what's the role of a nonprofit? What's the role of a for-profit in an industry that the government is trying to get out the door as fast as possible? So thanks very much, Roberto. And we can go to the next slide. And I think, Maria, we have you unmuted now. So just if we go forward there, Jess, one more slide. As a preamble to the session coming up now, we're going to move to our first speaker to set the scene. We kind of did the worldwide tour there in, in 20 minutes of what's happening, where we are, and essentially how far behind we are as Canadians in this industry, given all the great technology we have deployed um, or that we design and innovate and export. And so you can see here from the preamble that Maria's put up there, uh, there are the opportunities that hydrogen powered trains could be at the top of the rail industry, that Canada could be a leader, that they are cost effective and low maintenance. And there's loads of projects around the world from which Canadian deployers can learn without being the first out the door. Having said that, um, Ballard, Ricardo, Alstom, ABB, all good members or upcoming members of QTRIC that have fed into this process. And we're going to hear from some of them today presenting their innovations and their valued part of this industry. But we also heard the voices you know, from Metrolinx, from VIA, from CP, from CN being very clear with us in the last years. Look, rail is a large vested industry. 
Our locomotives are expected to last 50 years. The assets are meant to last a long, 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 long time. So investments tend to be epically slow because the asset has to last a lot longer than any given government. And one particular thing that was very interesting from our colleagues at CPNCN a couple of years ago was if we do launch hydrogen rail mobility as part of a decarbonized freight or passenger rail service, it's frankly going to have to be NAFTA negotiated because it will have to be USMCA or Kuzma compliant. There would have to be hydrogen fueling for those rail trains that cross the border, whether they have passengers on board or they have freight on board. And that's an interesting area that we haven't had to deal with with transit buses. It's most certainly something that we'll have to deal with with hydrogen rail. And so with that, uh, Maria, I'll turn to you to introduce our first speaker who's going to set the scene from the industry standpoint before we go into the consultation process. Uh, thank you, uh, Josipa. Yeah, our uh, first speaker uh, is Kim uh, Lynch from Valar Power System. And over to you, Kim, and we'll just introduce Kim by letting folks know Kim has been representing Ballard on one of our most important projects on the hydrogen fuel cell bus project. Um, so we have a lot of experience in terms of pulling a lot of knowledge from Kim on the bus side. And now what we've asked him to do is give us an overview of what the future is for hydrogen rail as well. Um, so thanks so much, Kim. Over to you. Hi, thank you for having me, everybody. Um, this is a very interesting topic. Um, my passion goes very deep in rail. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm not as technically advanced as, as many of the discussions have led already on this call, but my grandfather was one of the head engineers um, with two of the major rail lines here in Canada for many years. So I rode the rail, so I have a deep passion for it. As a business person, I try to, I'm close to the regional hub um, here with BIA, and I, I really want to see BIA come forward as, as a leader in the hydrogen industry. And I, I think it's vitally important, especially in the industrial corridor. And I want to make that very clear. But in my Ballard hat, Ballard is a, a global leader in the rail industry and in, in hydrogen. And I have to apologize. I am going to keep brushing my, my technology um, portfolio in rail so I can contribute to this group and be an active member, but I'm going to start with my presentation and um, if you need any additional technical um, feedback, please send me an email. I'd be more than glad to um, tap into our, our engineering uh, resources within Ballard and provide that valuable feedback to you. So again, I'm Kim Leach, a market development manager with Ballard Power Systems. I oversee the North American East development in all of Canada. So thank you for having me today. And I'm just going to share the screen here to my presentation. Hopefully our broadband network's strong enough here today and I can lead away. So let me know um, if everybody can see it. So there we go. So Ballard is powering the future of rail with hydrogen. Um, Ballard, obviously, as you know, um, has been in, in business for 43 years. We're a Canadian company. We, we as, a, as a technology provider, we provide solutions for buses and coach trucks, trains and vessels. And most recently this morning, I spent most of my efforts on a marine presentation because as, as we know, as hubs start to develop across the country, it, these, four platforms are gonna be vitally important to come together. So I'm, I'm finding myself addressing more and more on the rail and the marine side over the last few months because the discussions are driving us in, into that future. The hydrogen powered trains are poised to, to disrupt the rail industry. The environmental gains of electrification with performance and refueling time are comparable to diesel. They offer long range of uh, route flexibility, short refueling time and cost effective route um, electricity options. Fuel cell systems are scalable and a variety of routes for a variety of routes and applications. Their suitable applications include light rail, multiple units for regional passenger service and locomotives for shunting of freight. And as I see more and more development taking place in Eastern Canada, I really, really, especially in the renewable energy sector and, and um, seeing that opportunity for shunting and, and freight um, developing with some of our partners like Genesee, Wyoming in the West, um, looking at new technical solutions. The cost effective um, options for route electrification, the hydrogen train is already more competitive. This is a U.S. comparison than electric, than electric Cantonary for the use case with relatively long distance and low frequency. And that was a report put out by the Hydrogen Council in 2022. And if anybody would like a, a copy of that, please feel free to reach out to me. 
Um, Tim leads our, our rail sector in the United States, and he's my cohort. Um, nearly any train route served by the diesel trains can be serviced by hydrorail train. No requirement for overhead cantonary infrastructure and power substations. That's very important to me. My background's land use planning. And as we continue to develop out our provincial planning policies to ensure that we maintain that visual line of sight, reduction of clutter in visual lines, Hydrogen plays a, a very important role in that as we continue to develop our capital infrastructure around our cities to support that. So again, the reduction in cantonary infrastructure, I hold very dear to my heart and power substations. It also enables gradual electrification, one train at a time, aligned with budget availability. And as we know, capital improvements, we have to forecast and, and replacement, that's vitally important. There's zero emission, lower capex than non-electrified tracks, low OPEX and flexibility of range. So we're fuel cell innovators for over 40 years. We're dedicated to accelerate the adoption of fuel cell technology at Ballard. <clears throat> the fuel cell expertise that's in-house within Ballard, many of my co-workers have been with the company for over 27 to 40 years. Some are almost 40 years with the company. That's a lot of expertise within an organization to ensure that our end use applications um, bring the highest level of technology standards and education to our clients. That's something that um, we hold very dealer, dear, <laughs> dearly at Ballard. The customer care, we stand by our products and customers. We have an in-house customer satisfaction and care team, and the solutions we offer integrated systems to remove the barriers for our end use clients. So again, like I said, 43 years, 1100 employees. We, we planned on board over 700 employees in the next two years. 1400 patents were publicly listed. We have eight ships in development, which is really exciting. Seven train projects, 2200 trucks and 1400 buses. And this is rapidly increasing in the transit industry and stationary power products are also moving forward. Um, in fact, last week we had a team of our marketing team was at um, sustainable um, energy um, conference in the United States. So we see we see emerging markets moving forward. We have over 100 million kilometers in operations with 1.6 gigawatts of production capacity and a strong 2030 commitment to carbon neutrality. We're a vertically integrated manufacturer throughout the fuel cell value chain. We design, build and test proprietary core technology components to produce optimized fuel cell products for each application. Um, as you can see here, the unit cell components, MEA plates, fuel cell stacks, balance of plant component integration, fuel cell module and system design and energy systems and powertrain integration. So we really are an in-house solution for heavy duty motive. The dedicated portfolio of products for heavy duty mobility, the FC wave plays a very vital role in the heavy, heavy rail application and the FC rate rail 100 kilowatt um, is being released in 2023. Here's a quick sneak peek um, design that um, review for everybody. Um, the product development focuses on meeting performance and life cycle cost targets, improve power density, sim simplify battery and powertrain integration, reduce life cycle costs with increased operating temperature and improved stack and balance of plant component durability and re reduced catalyst loading. So as you can see, nice compact option here. The fuel cell products to fuel solutions and services. So the Ballard solution, the battery and fuel cell integration, the energy system and powertrain integration and the technology solution. So through Ballard care programs, the application engineering support, like I mentioned, in-house training, really an industry training standardization with Ballard that we will offer our, our end users, the extended warranty and service agreements that are available and the spare part management and fleet monitoring that module to mon uh, monitor fleet performance is, is really important. And we bring partnerships to the table, not only just through Ballard, but there's that whole P3 as we move forward. Where's that private public partnerships? We've got financing options that are available um, as well. And from road, 
from sorry on um, from road to rails over 15 years experience in designing heavy duty fuel cell options and that we're now on the eighth generation of module design and proven technology with 100 million kilometers traveled so the design considerations for rail are they modular modular scalable configuration we're seeing that um, with the heavy rail application safety i've been talking on a regular basis with electrical safety standards association tssa a lot of large organizations we have people in-house specifically dealing at the national and global scale on safety standardization in fact ballard's um, head of safety standards is a, is a global leader in, in that industry and making sure that global partners are coming on board and we can we can force that down and, and eliminate barriers. Balance of plant component choice and the durability of the product throughout its life cycle. The fuel cell rail module is 100 kilowatt building block of fuel cell power designed and tested um, to rail specific standards and proven fuel cell stack durability again offering over 30,000 hours of in in service operation. There's a nice example of that. Um, so our scope of supply is here that's clearly outlined with our integrators and our solution providers. Um, but as you can see there, that's the Ballard scope of supply right out to the power management. And then our trade projects, we, we're global. We've got a great global footprint, um, obviously in China with GOMAD China, China Light Rail Passenger Service since July, 2020. Um, the Siemens project in, in Europe, um, the Hydrofax project, Broderbrook that you spoke to earlier, the Scottish Rail project, EMU retrofit, North American's first hydrogen powered in line haul freight locomotive project, CP Rail. It's, you know, they're, they're increasing their orders to us, which is a great announcement for Ballard over the last few months. And then the Sierra North Railway switching locomotive and the Talgo test train in Spain. So the case study um, for Seaman Rail module development, it was a multi-year agreement to develop fuel cell systems for Siemens Miro. The Miro Plus H is a two-car train with operating range up to 800 kilometers. It was a rooftop mounted system which leverages Ballard's FC Move product and optimized weight and footprint for maximum range. And the FC uh, Rail 200 kilowatt module achievements, it's good up to minus 25. So we can actually use that in colder climates. Peak efficiency at 55%, the peak power is 200 kilowatts. It incorporates rail standards and it incorporates Ballard's long life FC Gen fuel stack technology and advanced balance of plant. Siemens is offering Miro fuel cell powertrains to its customers, and it's the first train in Germany unveiled in May 2022. Um, how am I doing for time? Am I <laughs> You're actually over time, Kim. So okay, just sorry. a flag to ask you if you wouldn't mind wrapping up, um, but great okay. information. Hyper speed um, per usual at QTrick. Yes, um, I just want to focus back on our Canadian flagship here, the, the CP Hydrogen Locomotive Program. This is a really important program in the heavy haul freight as we start seeing increase in, in industry again here in Canada. This is a real showcase for Ballard on its Canadian footprint. And again, our complete offering to our partners. My presentation is going to be available at the end for everybody. And I'm Kim Leach from Ballard. So thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. It was a lot of info we know, but we wanted people to see all the developments that have occurred. Um, so with that, what we're going to do is turn right to our next speaker, because we do have four speakers. We asked to set the scene of what's happening. So Kim first at Ballard gave us a great overview. Uh, next, we're going to turn to our colleagues at Ricardo Rail. We have David Bennett on the line, who's going to join us here in just a moment. Um, and we're going to ask Ricardo to walk us through some of the innovations they've been active in. The overarching goal here truly being that none of this now is as new as it was five years ago. Thanks so much, Kim. And um, in terms of where we were five years ago, there just weren't these deployments, these prototypes, these initiatives. Now, fast forward, there's so much more we can work with. And David, I see you there. So I'm going to turn to you just to see if we can see your screen. And OK, we see our screen. We don't see your screen. One second. And I think, Dave, we'll check your audio first. We can see if we can hear you. Yeah. And I'm, can, can, yeah. can, can you, are you yes. okay to hear me? It's... Yes, we can. A little delay, but otherwise all good. And I think we can see your screen. So right. over to you. And I will pop in when your seven to eight minutes is up. Okay, so let's just present it. Right. 
Okay, so I, I'm David Bennett from Ricardo. I'm a chief engineer within the Ricardo um, Automotive and Industrial Group. So uh, slightly different to uh, the Ricardo Rail Group you're you're used to dealing with. See, they 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 look after critical systems and asset management in the rail systems. Uh, with within automotive industrial, we look after development of engines and propulsion power. So that's right from clean sheet design to upgrading engines to uh, to certifying them to meet meet emissions. Um, uh, also, we have a have a third third partner that works in the rail area, which is our environmental consulting group, um, energy and environment. Who look at some some of the the wider sustainability issues associated. But from my point of view, from engines, I'm I'm going to be talking about hydrogen in uh, in combustion engines, and where 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 we see that fitting in future future products. Um, so at Ricardo, we've been uh, working working on hydrogen combustion. Um, there's uh, the two, two two assets we've been using to develop that. We have a single cylinder engine. We've been running with our partners at the University of Brighton. Um, so this is a, a, a 2.1 liter engine um, converted from a, a Proteus engine that we use to run diesel. Um, it's running direct injection hydrogen in the in the engine. Um, the advantages of running a, a single cylinder engine: it's it's very easy to to modify it. Um, it uses far less uh, far less fuel. Than, uh, than than larger engines, um, and and it's very easy to instrument it and collect data. Um, some of the disadvantages are uh, the overall performance doesn't mimic a mimic a full multi-cylinder engine. It doesn't have the same friction characteristics or the same boosting characteristics, and and it can only be used for steady state. Um, so so we use the single cylinder to develop the overall combustion approach for hydrogen. So how, how we're going to burn the hydrogen, what, what, when we're going to add the spark, what the combustion chamber is going to look like. Uh, then in par parallel, we have a, a, a multi-cylinder engine. So this is a six cylinder, 13 liter Scania engine. So this is converted from a Scania natural gas engine. Um, this is running at our, our facility in Shoreham where I work. Um, it's It runs uh, both, it's running both direct injection hydrogen, so hydrogen direct into the cylinder, and also port injection hydrogen, so hydrogen into the intake port, as you would normally do with a natural gas engine. Um, it runs with EGR, so e EGR is where we take the exhaust gas and refeed it back into, into the intake system. Uh, it provides some uh, benefits to the combustion system, reducing the, the boost requirements. Um, so, so the mold, mold that 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 engine, the multi-cylinder engine, is is part of a co-funded uh, UK project called HiMet, which is looking at hydrogen in an integrated uh, maritime uh, energy system. Um, and so, so in, in this case, looking at uh, uh, ret retrofit of engines on 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 maritime uh, uh, assets to run on hydrogen rather than diesel. Um, for the benefit of any energy engineers or scientists on the call, I, I thought I'd show a bit of data. Um, so this is uh, uh, measurements we've taken from our engine running at uh, a, a single point. So this is a, 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 a um, or, or three points in this case, 900 RPM, 1400 RPM and 1800 RPM. Um, and, and we're looking at varying the, the lambda, which is basically varying the amount of air that goes into the combustion system to look at ways of optimizing combustion. Um, and, and out of that, we're collecting uh, measurements of the emissions coming out of the tailpipe of the engine. So, so what would be released into the environment if, if you, you didn't have any after treatment. Um, and the first thing I think to say about a hydrogen combustion engine is it isn't zero emissions and it isn't zero carbon. Uh, so clear, clear differences there to maybe a fuel cell application. Um, but what we do find is we can run uh, our nitrous oxides, our NOx emissions down to extremely low levels when we run at high lambdas. So when we have high, large amounts of air, so maybe above lambda of 3.5, uh, far below what that, that we get out of a, a diesel engine or, or a gas engine. 
and with the application of EGR, we, we can get it lower and we can extend its operating range down to down to lower lambdas. Um, you might ask why, why why is there CO2 coming out of the engine? Uh, and, and why are there hydrocarbons coming out of the engine? Um, they're, they're, they're derived from, from oil. So being a combustion engine, we still use lubricating oil to lubricate the, uh, lubricate the cylinders uh, and other parts of the engine, the valve train. Some of that oil gets into the combustion system as it, as it would with any combustion engine. And that, that comes out as hydrocarbons, CO and CO2 in, in, into the exhaust. Um, again, very, very low, low levels, lower, lower than you would get from a normal combustion engine. But still an important point if you're looking for a zero CO2 solution or a zero emission solution, um, the hydrogen combustion engine doesn't provide that. Perhaps it provides a stepping stone towards that in that you're moving to a much lower uh, emissions, um, but that doesn't get you all the way there. Um, so on th this slide, I thought I'd talk about how how easy it is or difficult it is to convert a hydrogen engine. So looking at early to market products. Um, so where we've been looking at hydrogen engines, we've been keeping uh, uh, the diesel cylinder head. So it's a diesel like flat cylinder head running a very similar combustion system. We run it lean burn. So with lots of air to get uh, the highest brake thermal efficiency and mitigate uh, knock and also reduce the nitrous oxides coming out of the exhaust. It has a, has a lower compression ratio um, than the, um, the diesel engine um, and ignited via a conventional spark plug. So as you would have in a, in a large, uh, large heavy duty gas engine. Um, we have two, two, two systems we're exploring for the fuel injection. One is direct injection. So this means adding a hydrogen injector into the cylinder head. So modifying the cylinder head uh, with some uh, additional machinings and a sleeve that can take a hydrogen injector. So this is usually a, a side injector for, for access. Um, advantages of direct inje injection is it lowers the requirement for air and boost and also mitigates the risk of backfire. So, so backfire can occur when hydrogen in the intake manifold start, starts to burn. Um, port injection is injecting the hydrogen direct into the intake manifold. Um, it's the minimum change approach. It's the approach most uh, manufacturers are going for as they start in as they move into hydrogen because it is minimum change. As I say, it's te technically it's not the preferred, but it's the e easiest to engineer in. Um, so some of the other, other changes we, we need to look at, the air system. I talked about how we have to run the high lambdas, high amounts of air. So it's a new boosting system. So, so a single stay, a, a conventional uh, engine with a single turbocharger would, would go up to about 18 bar BMEP. So it's a, a less powerful engine than, than a diesel engine. Uh, to, to get a, a, an optimized future project product, we probably need to move to a two-stage boosting system to get the, the air in to burn the, burn the hydrogen efficiently and clean. And then as, as with a normal diesel engine, you'd keep the exhaust gas recirculation there. Uh, it helps the air mass flow reduction. Um, there's some small changes you need on the mechanical and functional system. So you need to look at the cooling system to match heat rejection changes. Also ensure you're cooling the spark plug uh, sufficiently and the hydrogen injector sufficiently if it's a direct injection. Um, oil control is important. We, 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 we saw the effects of the oil leaking past the rings. So we, we need to look at, at, at the rings. We need to look at the lubrication and the particles. Uh, and hy hydrogen is a low fuel lubricity. So diesel engine itself is a, is a, is a lubricant as, as well as a fuel. Hy hydrogen isn't. That, that means there's Im impacts on things that would naturally rely on that, like the valve train that need to be addressed. And um, David, I'm going to step in to let you know, we've just crossed over the timestamp. So we're going to ask you, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up, um, but uh, we can provide the full deck to all participants. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, did I, you, did you want to conclude? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, 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 
uh, maybe, maybe just some conclusions. Uh, just comparing uh, it with a with a with a, with a fuel cell, uh, a hydrogen engine is less efficient than a fuel cell. It it isn't zero emissions. It isn't as quiet as a fuel cell, but it also provides some benefits. It's got low, lower costs. It's tolerant to fuel contaminants. I know noticed there was some chatter on 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 on, on some chat on, around around that, and it's robust in particles. It can automatically have diesel type durability carried over. That's proven. So I think overall, while not net zero, uh, not a zero emissions hydrogen fuel combustion engines do offer an opportunity to extend the life of existing applications with a with a zero carbon fuel. So perhaps that's a good place to finish. Thanks so much, They We really appreciate that. And I know we made you go through a lot, but we did want folks to understand there are other applications for hydrogen on a powertrain than just the fuel cell stack application um, with that whole system. So David, I think you're going to hear a lot of feedback from that in the consultation group. That is something that came up in our previous consultation in terms of those other alternative powertrain designs. So thanks so much for that, David. And next, we're going to turn to our colleague Ian Hodgkinson. Um, over to you, Ian. And uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Ian. Ian has been really helping us extensively in the last little while. The whole team at Alstom has just helping us understand what the hydrogen application and rail potential is in Canada. And of course, prior to Alstom, we had Bombardier as one of our founding members at Qtric. And so the rail um, history at Qtric runs long, even though we haven't launched projects before. And we're really excited to have Alstom as a partner going forward to be able to make this happen. So with that, over to you, you Ian. Well, thank you, Yusipa, for that kind of introduction. Can you hear me well? It's great. E excellent. And you can see my screen all right? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, good uh, Good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you, Yusipa. And thank you, Maria, for inviting us to present. Um, we really appreciate it. And, and as Yusipa, as you queued up earlier, this is a really exciting time and, and uh, definitely lots of room for movement in the hydrogen space uh, as regards to rail in Canada. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, my name is Ian Hodkinson. I'm the Director of Technical Sales for Turnkey Transit Systems, which means I tend to get involved with turnkey uh, rail to end-to-end -end rail lines uh, around North America. Um, I've been involved with some of our hydrogen projects here in North America for a little over a couple of years now as we've been starting to explore the space. Just to talk really quickly a little bit about um, Alstom in Canada. So Alstom is, is currently uh, Canada's only domestic rail manufacturer. We have four uh, uh, manufacturing facilities across Canada. We also do operations and maintenance of uh, rail systems in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal, uh, and have a number of projects going on from coast to coast and make a little bit of everything, um, ranging from streetcars and LRVs to metros and subways through to intercity trains and, and eventually um, uh, High-speed trains is also something we're looking at. Roughly 4,300 employees, and our headquarters for the Americas is based in uh, here in Montreal, just outside the Montreal area. Worth mentioning that, as Yosipa mentioned, um, uh, Alstom concluded the transaction with Bombardier Transportation, acquiring Bombardier Transportation, a little over a year and a half ago. So now we're uh, a combination of the two companies, around 70,000 employees globally. Um, a couple of things on our side that we wanted to share is, is um, you know, this space looking at zero emissions or rail applications is something that's extremely important to us. Um, so much so that we launched an innovation center um, here in Montreal to look at green attraction solutions for the rail sector uh, earlier this year. So in July of this year, uh, we nominated a director of this uh, division. We're also beginning to staff up. Um, we're hoping to have a, a roughly 80 employees that will be uh, employed looking at green uh, solutions uh, for the rail industry. Um, the Innovation Center will be located uh, here in, in St. Bruno, uh, alongside our, our main design center in, in the Americas. And we also have access to our prototype center, which is just across the road, which allows us to do prototyping and other sorts of innovative activities. So again, the real main mandate of the Innovation Center is to look at um, how to apply green technologies to the rail industry. And of course, that includes hydrogen as well as battery technology. Let, let's talk about the island. And, and it's I'm, I'm very flattered, Josipa and others, that, that you've spoken so much about the island already. I, I feel that there, I hope there's still something to share. Um, a few things that we wanted to, to share with you, though, is um, what is the island? It's, it's the first passenger rail vehicle in the world to be entirely hydrogen powered. And I'll talk a little bit about the history in a second. Um, this year, we were we were very excited in that we, we set two new precedents with our customer LNVG in, in Germany. Uh, the first is that LNVG converted their first line to an entirely hydrogen operated line. 
what does that mean is that historically there was a line for LNVG um, that was operating using diesel multiple units, and they have procured an entire fleet of hydrogen vehicles to replace that. And as a consequence, there's an entire line which now operates with a zero, uh, a zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, solution uh, to provide rail pa uh, tra passenger transportation in Germany. Very exciting. The second thing that's, that's interesting is, is that um, at around the same time, we set a distance record just prior to Intertrans this year, so a little over two months ago, where we wanted to see how far we could actually go on a, on a single tank, if you will, of, of hydrogen fuel. So we did so, and we got up to 1,175 uh, kilometers, so 1,175 kilometers on a single uh, fuel up, if you will, or a single tank of hydrogen gas, which I think speaks to, to the, the capability of the technology to meet some of the operational mission profiles we're trying to hit in the industry. Really quickly to explain what is the island as, as a vehicle, it's a regional train. So a regional train is something, unfortunately, we don't have much experience with in North America. Um, it provides intercity service to secondary and smaller cities. Um, a lot of these lines are relatively low density from a traffic perspective, and as a consequence, it doesn't make business sense to electrify them, which would, in a lot of other cases in Europe, be sort of the natural reaction. And as a consequence, the primary means of, of transportation on a lot of these lines has been diesel multiple units up until now. Now there's increasing interest, um, as we'll see in a couple of the further slides, to look at things like the island, which offer a zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions alternative to allow for, for the possibility of, of operating these lines without, without emissions. Just to go through a little bit of the history of the project, and, and apologize if some of you have seen it before, but I think it's a little material to the conversation. Um, the island project was started in 2014. Um, two pre-production uh, units were produced by 2016. As the trains were homologated in Germany, which essentially means they, they received authorization according to the governing safety body in Europe, uh, to, or in Germany, excuse me, to operate in 2018 and entered into uh, commercial service in 2018. So they've been operating for the last four years. Um, have done about 200,000 kilometers uh, on those pre-production trains since that time. Uh, we've since received orders, and I mentioned earlier, LNVG is, is we now got a full line that's been uh, has gone into service. We've also done a number of demonstrations in a number of countries. Uh, so that includes uh, France, of course, Germany, uh, Sweden, Austria, Poland, uh, and and I believe I'm forgetting one or two, and my apologies if I am. None, nonetheless, suffice to say that a number of different regions in, in Europe have benefited from demonstrations of the technology. Really quickly, and you've already seen this today, but how does it work? So the island, it's, it's roof mounted, as some of the colleagues have mentioned about other, uh, other types of systems. So hydrogen is stored on the roof. Uh, the fuel cell is also installed on the roof. Batteries underneath the vehicle, as is a conventional electric propulsion underneath the vehicle. And as we all know now, the basically hydrogen from the fuel cell or from the fuel storage is combined at the fuel cell and reacted with oxygen from the air to create uh, water and electricity, which is used to both recharge the batteries and to power the, the electric uh, powertrain. Um, one thing that's interesting, and I think it's material to some of the points that I believe Maria was making earlier about simulation, is, is that we see um, going towards greener solutions as being a spectrum type approach. That there isn't necessarily a one size fits all. There's different applications that are required for different uh, solutions. Um, as an initial step, as we move towards uh, zero greenhouse gas emissions, Obviously, there are some combined systems where looking at combinations of diesel with other solutions could be things that some customers are looking at. Um, we've seen that recently in, in, uh, with the train Maya, which is going to be both diesel and, and overhead catenary. And likewise, uh, here in Montreal, uh, EXO operates some of our Alp 45 DPs, which have are both electric and, and diesel and have the capability of running um, on catenary on a card. Going to fully emission-free, battery has a role, as does hydrogen, as does conventional electrification. And often, we tend to put electrification to the side. And ultimately, I think one of the challenges that we look uh, forward to as an industry is to try and understand which technology is, is best applied in which scenario. And that's why I think things, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Maria, looking at simulations and looking at the cost models, which allow um, stakeholders to understand the pros and cons of different technologies is essential to allow us to try and make intelligent decisions on which technology is best suited. Um, from our perspective, we see application for all. Uh, it's really just a question of, of which fits uh, best in which place. Looking at some specific projects uh, that are coming forward on our side, um, we continue to move forward with the technology in Europe. Um, the Caradia Stream is, is a uh, hydrogen fuel cell train in Italy that we'll be deploying uh, shortly. Um, an interesting project that to share with you is, is the Caradia Polyvalent, which is for France, France which is um, sort of dual energy. On the one hand, it's both a fuel cell operated train and can operate off catenary, but can operate on catenary 
um, when it's available. So it allows you to sort of run on mainline. And then if you want to branch off and go to non-electrified territory, it gives that flexibility to the customer. And, and, and hopefully it's something we could eventually consider to be uh, useful in, in Canada or in the United States. And then we also have um, Coridea Continental trains for, for uh, Germany, which are, again are a battery train. So it shows that there can be a variety of solutions and that actually mixing and matching can all sometimes be an alternative, which can be interesting and appealing, depending on the operational needs and the context of the line under consideration. And that's all I have to share with you today. Uh, I hope uh, you see if I'm about on time. You are um, exactly on time, although I believe excellent. I'm a voice from the ether. My video is not popping up there, so it'll pop up there in a moment. I'll just have Jess make me live. So perfect timing, Ian. A very great overview and uh, just as a bit of historical interest when we did start this initiative five years ago and did our first like first review across Canada of hydrogen. It was just the first Karadia Island starting um, and there was no passenger data. There was no um, operational data. So super Super, super interesting. Um, so what we're going to do is fast forward. Now, we had given everybody a little bit of extra time because I believe we had a technical issue with our colleagues from ABB. But Maria, is it correct that our colleague is now on the line? If that is the case, um, Ian, I'm going to thank you. And we're going to turn to our colleagues from ABB. Unfortunately, we deleted their slide because we thought they were not on the line. Uh, so I think it's Ahmed. I believe that you are going to be presenting. Let's just double check. Yes, it's me. Okay, so sorry, <laughs> Ahmed. We, yes, we don't have your introductory slide because we thought we were not able to have you on the line, but we can now. So if we can make you live um, and we can turn to you and you can walk us through the presentation. Happily, we've baked enough time in the schedule in our plenary session at the end. So we still have enough time for the full consultation. With that, over to you, Ahmed. If you'd like to introduce yourself, ABB being one of our founding members, also one of the active partners that has encouraged us to enter into the rail innovation landscape in Canada. So over to you, Ahmed. I will give you the notice though at the seven minute mark perfect thanks a lot so uh, again sorry for this uh, technical issue you had on your side to uh, raise the slide and so on uh, this is Ahmed and I'm from ABB corporate research in Sweden and I work is as, here as a principal scientist in power electronics so my presentation actually today will be quite uh, more technical let's uh, say like that uh, and I will be talking about the power electronics role in future hydrogen systems. So the agenda of this presentation, uh, of this uh, presentation will be like that. I will start first with one slide about the R&D at ABB and then ABB Research Sweden, hydrogen demand. And I think we heard a lot through the previous slides about the hydrogen demand and so on. And then we move to the hydrogen power trains and the need for power electronics uh, across the whole power train from the production and utilization sides and then power electronics in the hydrogen production side and then power electronics in the uh, hydrogen utilization side with some high level conclusions uh, to give some insights. So quickly here, since I have only seven or eight minutes, uh, the R&D at ABB, we are actually distributed across the, the, the globe, <laughs> let's uh, say like this, with 1.15 billion annual uh, invest investments and plus 7,000 scientists and technologists. We are there as research centers or uh, corporate research centers in, in 10 countries. As you can see here, states, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Sweden, Finland, and so on. And I'm basically here in Sweden. And we have quite a lot of university collaborations and uh, quite uh, some uh, active startups here, investments, and a lot of strategic partnerships with quite strong uh, patent families. Uh, if I focus more on ABB Research Sweden or ABB Corporate Research in Sweden, so we are located in a city called Vestros, which is like less than one hour from Stockholm, the capital of Sweden. And we are established more than 100 years ago uh, with more than 100 co-workers from more than 35 nationalities uh, by the time of today or by the day, uh, more than 60% of us with PhDs and about uh, 10 or more actually with associate uh, or associate professors or affiliated faculty in different faculties actually or different universities. We have also intense uh, lab infrastructure and we have also university collaborations locally here in Sweden like KTH and LIU, MDU and Chalmers, UU also, Uppsala University and globally MIT, Stanford and so on. So we have four main focus areas here in our research centers, uh, mainly ABB Research Sweden, 
we are focusing on the physical and digital powertrains, where we are looking also at the hydrogen powertrains here that I'm going to talk about. We are focusing on the future robotics. We are also looking at the future switching and systems and autonomous automation. So now if I start digging more into uh, the topic of today that I'm going to talk about the power electronics rule in, in hydrogen uh, systems, just quickly here to highlight this, and I think this said quite uh, several times before in the previous slides, hydrogen is playing a vital role in uh, limiting or reaching these net zero emissions here. And as you can see here across the supply chain, hydrogen can be used almost everywhere. And then if we are looking at the transport part and just look here at the demand, the transport section is expected to have the highest demand by 2050 following this uh, net zero emissions uh, scenario. So now if we look at the hydrogen power trains and where we see power electronics, uh, where we are talking mainly about converters and, and so on. So if we start from here, where we can start with the production, considering the scenario where we have uh, electrolyzers, water electrolysis uh, operations. So we can start with a medium voltage grid here or the grid in general, and we can have also some renewables as you can see here. And then we can go to the electrolyzers through some converters and with some typical configurations, you need also some filters and compensation. And then you will need also around the electrolyzer some balance of plant or, or compression and also in the storage and transmission. And then this can be used in the mobility where you have you might have also fuel cells or you can have combustion engine where you use also hydrogen there directly. But also you will have converters here to integrate the fuel cell maybe with batteries or supercapacitors or both of them together to feed the motor and you will have converters also around the whole uh, system. And you can use this with energy storage for stationary application or direct feedstock here. So all these red blocks that I'm showing are power converters. So what you can see is that power converters are needed across the whole uh, hydrogen power train, the electrified one that I'm showing here. And if we start focusing more on the production side, so this part here where we have the converter, and this usually can be, if we are talking about the grid as a state-of-the-art solution, it can be the grid, medium voltage grid, and then going to a transformer to step down the voltage, and then a converter to convert this voltage from AC to DC uh, to feed the electrolyzer here. And based on what technology that we can use, where we can offer different technologies being thyristors or diodes, uh, rectifiers with buck converters or, or IGPTs directly, you will impact both sides, the grid side and the electrolyzer side, as you can see here. And going from thyristor to IGPTs, as you can see, you will see some impacts on the harmonics and also the reactive power or the power factor from another uh, perspective or another way of saying it. And if you look at the electrolyzer side, going also from thyristors to IGPTs, as you can see here, you will impact also the ripples or the nature of the ripples. And this in turn will also impact the lifetime and performance of the electrolyzer there. So different transformer and converter configurations can be utilized. And these converters or these configurations, as I said, they will result in different uh, performance indices as I'm showing here, considering the apparent power, reactive power, which can be reflected on the power factor and the conversion efficiency. Some of them, they will give you quite high efficiency, but also they are consuming quite large amount of uh, reactive power and this in turn is introducing quite low power factors so you need some VAR compensation and you need to install some etc components filtering and so on and some others the, the, the can come somewhere in between so this is something that you need to look at it and over lifetime this also efficiency will impact the, the OPEX and then this also will impact the total cost of ownership. Now, if we start looking at the utilization side, and mainly I'm looking at this part where, I'm, where we have the mobility. So usually for such systems, we will end up having hybrid systems and hybrid is quite interesting solution to meet the different requirements. And I'm showing here a hybrid system where we are using batteries together with fuel cells to feed my load, which can be uh, the propeller if I'm talking about the vessel or it can be my traction motor if I'm talking about rail in this case. And one of the typical integration schemes that you will have DC to DC converters here with the battery and the fuel cell, and then one common DC to AC converter, and then 
you have a common AC bus to integrate different sections, uh, depends on the power level, and then you have AC to DC to AC power conditioning stage to feed your traction motor. On the other hand, you can have also alternative configurations to the configuration I show with on the left, where you can have AC configurations, where also you can have direct online batteries, but you will have some challenges there that this DC to D, this DC to AC power conditioning stage has to handle the battery voltage across the different state of charges uh, during the operation. Or you can use only DC to AC converters here, uh, as I'm showing on, on this side. Moreover, you can also move to DC schemes and you can have DC to DC converters with each component here, or you can have direct online batteries again. However, looking at these different schemes that I'm highlighting here on this, uh, in this graph, you, they will result in different CAPEX, depending on the profile that you are studying and so on. And they will result also in different efficiencies. And if you're looking here for this typical scheme, I'm going from the fuel cell to the motor or from the fuel cell to the battery or from the fuel cell and the battery together to the motor, this can impact at the end the hydrogen consumption over lifetime and then the OPEX and also when you are going to do this maintenance, when you are going to do the replacements and so on, and the total cost of ownership at the end at the end so the integration scheme to go, together with the power profile should be studied and investigated with these different integration schemes and ahmed so, i just have to flag oh we're conclusion. at the end so over to you just to conclude perfect timing <laughs> yes i saw once you stepped in with the camera i noticed that you want to uh, highlight to me that i should end okay so in conclusions we see that power electronics are going to play uh, really key role in future hydrogen systems. And with this clean energy transition to sustainable energy and so on, there are a lot of opportunities we see with electrolyzers and fuel cells to be explored as I'm highlighting here, like innovative converters, system integrations, the hybrid operation, the interaction with renewables being with on the production side or the utilization side, also from control and power management perspective, system stability and uh, lifetime extensions and optimization. So that's all from my side. Thank you. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Ahmed. I know we ask you to squeeze a lot in a short period of time. We will be sharing the decks with everybody, and I have no doubt that lots of folks will have several follow-up queries. We also have a lot of sessions about this at our conference coming up. So with that, what we're going to do, thank you so much, Ahmed, and thanks for joining from a European time zone as well. Please stay online yeah, now for the, uh, for the final portion. Um, we're going to turn to the final portion of our consultation. And so essentially what we do is we've done this worldwide tour of all the stuff that's happening happening out there. And then we've had our industry partners present to you what's actually happening within their companies. And they are members of Qtrick or partners of Qtrick. So they actually are the partners that would invest in doing this stuff in Canada or helping us to do some component of it in Canada. Um, now what we have to figure out is so that we're not just in our ivory towers over here talking to ourselves at Qtrick. We need to figure out if our members and stakeholders in the industry more broadly want us to do anything about it. There may be no role for Qtrick in rail innovation in Canada. And that's something we need to hear if that's case, there may be a very important role, and that's something we need to hear, and there may be a hybrid role. Um, now, we know what our partners have asked us for. They have asked us for feasibility work, and that's why we created Root Eye Rail. But maybe there's something else we need to be doing instead, and maybe we're misled. So who we have on the line today, and we know not everybody was able to stay for consultation, but is rapid fire consultation. The outcomes of this are being shared with Transport Canada, with NRCAN, with infrastructure, and they're part of our own business plan for 2023 with our members going forward. We've got in the room transit agencies and rail operators, uh, government industry partners, consulting services, companies, academia, and several nonprofits that are part of our organization. And thank you for attending today. If uh, we walk you through now to the next slide, Jess, I'm just going to explain the methodology. And then you're all, if you're on the line, you're going to be pushed into your relevant group. So we have two questions that we are seeking to answer for Transport Canada and for the federal government in particular, and for our own board of directors and our own members for the 2023 business plan and into 2025. Number one, to what extent should hydrogen rail demonstration projects be an investment focus for the government of Canada? So we know that CP and CN have plunked their own money into their prototypes, but via Metrolinks, others, 
to what extent from the public transit or passenger mobility landscape should hydrogen rail demonstrators be an investment focus for the government? If that's something that our members are asking us to communicate with government and advocate for, then that's something we should be doing, but we need to hear from it today uh, from everybody on the line. And if the extent should also provide us with some guidance on what, what about it uh, should we be involved in? And the second question is more to the core of it. After you let us know whether hydrogen rail should be an investment focus in Canada, if you go forward one slide, Jess, the second question is what's our role at QTRIC? So your answer may be nothing. You know, your answer may be uh, as a nonprofit, step out of the way, you've done what you need to do, you flagged it, you're running a conference, that's good enough. Should it be something more? Should it be something like the Zero Emissions Transit Fund that we designed and helped communicate and got out the door with the federal government? And QTRIC takes great pride in the fact that we designed and helped to get out the door the fundamentals of the 2.75 billion Zero Emissions Transit Fund and the Canada Infrastructure Bank financing program. That was several years of work that we put into that in terms of modeling and work um, and financial analysis and economic analysis with both Infrastructure Canada and CIB before that program got out the door. So is should we be doing Doing that should there be a 10 or 15 million dollars zero emissions rail um, transit feasibility program and should there be an equivalent billions of dollars into rail demonstration programming that's what we want to know today so methodologically what we're going to do is we've got you broken out into four groups in general it's industry government um, academia and consulting and our nonprofit partners have been divided based on their expertise as best as we can there might be a little bit of mixing there where we have a couple representatives duplicated but in general you've got four moderators myself conrad Titash, and dominique on the line and so our technical colleagues on the line are going to push you into the relevant group your moderator is going to walk you through these questions in rapid fire in about 25 minutes given the group on the call and then we reconvene into the plenary and the outcomes turn into our first high level report on this initiative and what our role is uh, going forward to the federal government so with that i'm going to check in with jess and karen i believe uh, that we are all in right place and so magically now we will all get pushed into our groups if you do, are not representing an organization we open this up to canadians as well uh, you might be an individual but not representing an organization then you will stay in the main room uh, because our representation is by membership in an organization or an institution so only institutional reps get put into focus groups but feel free to stay on the line so that when we come back in plenary, you can hear the outcomes of the guidance discussion. Uh, so with that, uh, give us just one minute here. We need to have the uh, lovely music from Jeopardy playing while we all get pushed into our groups and we'll see ourselves pop up there in just a moment. So folks should be seeing a screen pop up asking if they want to join their breakout room. So go ahead and join those. We'll just wait two minutes for the others to join. They'll be uh, they'll be here in less than a minute. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. I know that was rapid fire, and I'm sure we got a lot of input in a very short period of time. What we're going to do here in just the last couple of minutes as people join from their focus groups, um, we're going to do a quick round of just updating what we heard in our groups. And I'll start off with group number one at a high level. We had folks from the Rail Association, the Canadian Hydrogen Fuel Cell Association, Metrolinx, uh, Alstom, several partners there giving us a lot of feedback. And in general, uh, the answer to question one is the government definitely in Canada should be involved in hydrogen rail. Um, there are areas like standardization, funding for demonstrators, supporting a regulatory framework, and then actively building the ecosystem for hydrogen fuel, uh, whether it's blue or green, but growing that hydrogen fuel supply chain, that'll be critical. There was also the feedback that demonstrators need to be more than two or three year things in rail. This We're talking about demonstration projects that could be 10 plus years in length to make a difference. And the answer to the second question in general that we heard as well was, as there is a role for QTRIC first as a convener of stakeholders in the industry to keep the momentum going. Second, as a neutral third party entity, like we achieved in electric bus and fuel cell bus, but the root eye rail third party neutral data analytics role that is a place we can play. And then thirdly, joining as a glue, making sure that transit agencies or operators that are trying to do this stuff across the country 
big country, small population, we need to make sure everybody knows what everybody else is doing so that nobody's starting from scratch because it's expensive and broad and time consuming. So with that, I'm going to turn to group number two, led by my colleague, Conrad. Um, Conrad, I'm just going to check over to you if you want to give us the high level overview of what your group came back with. Thank you, Yosifa. For question one, uh, the high level feedback was a resounding yes. Um, and with a bit of uh, information provided that um, it would be important to focus on public relations as well, because it's important to, to change perceptions around um, how hydrogen is applied. Um, so in terms of the political lobbying, the economic assessments, and also the business-led uh, initiatives, all of that forms part of more of a public relations um, uh, piece as well. So um, that was definitely um, a yes um, with, with those few um, additions. And for question number two was also a resounding yes, um, mainly from the point of view of doing neutral data modeling um, and being able to cross-pollinate uh, various um, elements of the data sciences. And also looking at it from a project management perspective, being the glue, as you said, the convener, being able to bring people together and facilitate very complex uh, technology commercialization issues in Canada. Thank you so much, Conrad. That is great. Yeses, we like to hear, just means we have a lot of work to do. So that is great too. Next, I'm going to go to Tatash for your one minute summary, Tatash, in your group, where I know we had a lot of our academic partners. Oh, you've got yourself muted. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Yosefa. Uh, so uh, quickly and update some of the things that I'm, I've already captured. I'm going to refine it, but uh, they would like to see um, uh, the government play a role in making sure the regional passenger rail is highlighted. Um, they can reduce and optimize a lot of cost by using uh, the new technology like hydrogen with very low risk. Uh, that is involved from an international perspective, government plays a very important role as it is very closely allied with the energy uh, Ministry of Energy and Climate Change. So building a relationship with that and that can prove beneficial because that has happened in um, the European countries. Um, and the, uh, the, the thing about in the Australian technology, the big topic is the Ministry of Transportation, which is a part of the Ministry of Energy, as I mentioned. And the, they have invested quite amount of funds uh, to make sure the technology is working. And they have done enough research al allied with a lot of organizations. In terms of uh, how can Qtrick play a role, Qtrick can play a role by uh, lobbying, obviously, for a lot of these um, funds and policies to come into place, like ZETF. However, they should focus on uh, routes which are low risks. For example, the Banff and uh, Calgary or the Vancouver Island, rather than Go Train, which is very high on demand and also have public transportation in it. And then um, the last one is that the retirement time of uh, these trains, which has to be kept keeping. Uh, kept in consideration to build a business case to include um, the operators of these trains. Um, that how do we build a business case to include the operators, the train operators? Thanks so much, Satash, very detailed. And lastly, we'll go to Dominique. Dominique, I know that you had several of our consulting members in the room. So over to you, Dominique. Yes, we did. Thanks, Yosefa. Um, so we had a really good conversation and just to give a high level, high level overview for the first question, um, there was a consensus that uh, it's difficult to electrify long distance rail, so hydrogen could be considered as an alternative to this, um, and the government could help fund this. Uh, an example was given that they could fund CN and CP R&D research that could eventually be shared with field rail. Uh, and there was also some feedback with this question um, that really questioned whether we should look into hydrogen as a end goal solution or an interim approach into uh, a different solution that could be uh, longer lasting. For the second question, um, there was several participants that mentioned that Qtrick modeling could help the government with a full cost benefits, benefit analysis. Um, it was also noted that it's important to model the efficient long-term operating costs and not just the capital costs, because that's where we can see a lot of benefit. Uh, there was also um, some discussion about how Qtrick could help, help look at the larger economic impacts of adopting hydrogen technology and rail. 
uh, and whether it would add to positive uh, economic outputs such as job creation and, and other things. So that was just a high level overview of what we discussed. Thanks so much, Dominique. And last word to you, Jessica, and I know folks have to log off, but uh, we would ask if you have just three more minutes and we're going to just share with you also an outline of the conference coming up. But over to you, Jessica, for the last minute of review. Yeah, I'll actually just mention one or two items that came out of our group. Uh, for the first question, uh, resounding uh, confirmation that the government of Canada should be involved in investing, but there was a question of what type of investment and what the nature of that investment would be and how it would be distributed across the country, uh, noting, noting the, just the geographic diversity of Canada. And then the second thing to mention is on the second question, uh, there was a feeling that QCHIC should lean into its legacy of innovation and really uh, be at the forefront of these conversations, specifically around the nexus of developing policy and standardization. There was also mention of a role for QTRIC in terms of developing opportunities to inform and educate uh, various transit stakeholders as well. That's extremely helpful. Thanks so much, Jessica. So it sounds like we got some resounding yeses, a lot of work to do, lots of feasibility, some government advocacy, serve as the glue, and then make sure that we are also not overlapping with what other ven venerable associations like CHFCA, the Rail Association of Canada are doing in this space as well. Uh, power in numbers. So we will conclude, uh, folks. I'm just going to ask, uh, Jess, if you can go forward one slide just to conclude for you, everyone. Heads up, the next sessions that we are developing are the battery electric bus integration with rail stations, passenger data analysis and rail to bus transit scheduling, a headache for all Canadians, I think, autonomous bus crossings with autonomous rail systems, high frequency rail versus high speed and cybersecurity. That's our agenda into the next year. And out of that, we will have a bona fide business case with our members in rail as to what we need to at QTRIC invest in to get out the door. If we can go forward just to conclude, then just heads up that our conference is coming up. All these topics we've tried to shove in as much content as possible. It's happening at the end of this month. If you are not sure if you're attending or you're trying to attend, but you can't get approval because it's late in the year and we shifted to in-person, let us know, send us an email and we'll see what we can do for you, especially if you're in a public sector entity. And if you go forward, we're just going to conclude on the high level panels, the electrifying rail hubs, the track to success, the highs and lows for light rail transit, high speed um, vacuum train. So there is a transpod session there and then several panels and keynotes on the new tech in hydrogen rail. And we will conclude on a funky uh, video that I think will also wake us up on a Monday afternoon. So over to you, Jess, for that invite to the conference. All right. So I love that music. It always wakes us up. Uh, we have a lot to do and not enough years ahead of us before climate catastrophe takes an effect even more seriously than it already has. So thank you, everyone, for your great input. I think we have our marching orders and some action forward. Um, with that, I will uh, motion to adjourn the meeting at 3.04. And uh, since I've got you on our screen, Ian, it's an informal situation, but we always get a motion to adjourn. Even though you're not a member designate yet, I'll just ask if you would make a motion to adjourn. Unless you are, and I missed that, so apologies. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yes, no, I, I motion to adjourn makes sense to me. Thank you for the honor. I appreciate it. Thanks very Thank much. You. And I think I saw Mark Kirby on the line as well, or Rob Stasco, uh, if I can ask for a seconder. I'll second it, Robert Thanks. Stasco.
That, that's great. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, so our next meeting, January 17th, we won't, unless you're at our conference, uh, we won't see you between now and then. So have a very safe holiday season. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe. And if we do see you at the conference, then we're really looking forward to seeing you. Uh, take care, everyone. And thank you again for your time and effort. It's really, truly appreciated on our end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank have you. a good day. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, love.